welcome to our devotion for today, Friday. It is indeed a joy and a privilege to be with you this morning. I am delighted that we are now at the end of the week and it's Friday. And the beautiful thing about it is that it is a rainy Friday. And if there isn't anything that I like better than Friday is a rainy Friday. Water has been my sign and I'm truly enjoying this moment here. I trust that you can have access to a window so that you can look out the window as we reflect this morning. And allow yourself to be lost in the beauty and the greenery and the, the grayness. It's interesting that the grayness of a rainfall is not an ugly grayness, but it is a, it's a fresh grayness. And so I trust that you have access to a window that you can, you can look out and just listen to the rain as it falls and just give God thanks. Not just for a new day, but thanks for everything because the the rain and the rain in and of itself speaks to renewal, it speaks to purification, to cleansing. It speaks to revitalization as it brings new life to the plants. And that means that we are then able to have provision to continue our lives. So all of this comes together for us this morning. So I trust that we will allow this moment to really be an important moment for us so that we can, we can really have this time together and that we can really enjoy the fact that we are here, we are together, we are alive, we are blessed as we begin this new day.
we begin our worship this morning, I just read a comment that someone wanted us to have the hymns printed so that they could follow. Um, this would be great if we were doing it once or twice a week, but um, doing it every day, it would be a little bit much on us. Um, but we will see what is possible. But then we can always invite some volunteers to assist but then all together then that might even be better. So we open ourselves to God's guidance and if you so desire you can let me know and we can ask you to offer us some help. Light has sprung up for the righteous. Rejoice in the Lord your righteous. Most gracious and ever loving God, we give you thanks for the rest of the past night and for the gift of a new day with its many opportunities of pleasing you. Today we bring before you all students and teachers returning to their various places of learning. We thank you for the gift of knowledge and trust that by your grace teachers may be guided to impart this knowledge to their students. We ask that there be a spirit of openness in each student to receive and wrestle with this knowledge. We also bring before you institutions that are experiencing challenges in any way and ask that you enliven their leaders and students with faith to trust in you during these difficult times. We offer these petitions in no other name than Jesus the Christ. Amen. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring, us, bring forth in us the fruit of good works through Jesus Christ, O Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading today continues in the gospel according to John the ninth chapter beginning to read at the 18th verse the Jews did not believe that he had been blind this is the man that was born blind and had been healed by Jesus. The Jews did not believe that he'd been born blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind but we do not know how it is that now he sees nor do we know who opened his eyes ask him he is of age he will speak for himself his parents said this because they were afraid of the jews for the jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed jesus to be the messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. 
You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Here ends the reading. I've always found this a wonderfully stimulating passage. And I, I love the part that John gives to the man born blind. The man sounds almost like a theologian. He, he speaks from his knowledge through the years of how God relates. And you can't help but, but see the contrast in the leaders of the day who constantly come back to that notion in contrast to Jesus' statement, but that, that notion that this man is a sinner. This man, because he was born blind, he must be a sinner. And they're holding on to that for their life. They are prepared to, to accept and believe everything that they know about Moses whom they have not seen, but have only heard about or read about. And the one who is in front of them, who is demonstrating the presence of God, mm, he's, he's a sinner. He's not from God. It almost sounds as though to be from God, to be connected to God, you have to be in scriptures, you have to be in the holy book. Your name must be there, written down. Or you must have lived some long, long time ago. But you can't be here now because you're not one of us. You're not one of us. You've not had a training. You've not had the teaching. You're not allowed to have a direct experience of God. Why would God choose you, an ordinary person like you, over me, one trained? Why would God do that? God wouldn't do that. God believes in order. God comes through the lines that we have set up for God to come through. So this man, this man can't be of God because he has not come through the lines that we have set up for God to act through. The arrogance of some of these statements in scriptures is just profound. And you've got to listen to it, really listen to it. I always encourage persons to listen to the scriptures and and when you read the scriptures, to, to read them with the dynamics of the language and really hear what's being said. And, and not just read them 
you know, so that you call every word properly, but read them with, with the, the energy that you would think would be coming across. And this is one of those, one of those passages that has more in the dynamics of the engagement than it does in the actual words. There's Jesus, there's the man born blind, the appearance, and then the authorities. The authorities come to the parents with their story of sin because the parents know that the authorities believe that they have sinned or that they, the, the child has sinned. And they, they ask, is this your son? Is this your son? How is it that he was seen? And you said that according to you, he was born blind. We don't know if he should believe you or not because if he was really born blind, he shouldn't be able to see now. So all that dynamic is in there. And the, parent, the parents play along with the dynamic and they say, well, he's our son. Yes, we can, we can attest to that. He's being blind from birth. Well, we can attest to that too because we have been with him all these years. But anything else that you want to know about him, he is of age. Let him speak for himself. It's a beautiful energetic passage and it helps us really to reflect a lot on what it is that we believe, what it is that we hold to be true. How willing are we to let go of that which challenges our way of understanding the world? How willing, how willing are we to move beyond where we are and, and realize that there may be something more? that there may be a whole lot more that we are not exposed to. A lot of the challenges that are facing our modern day world is, a lot of them have to do with the challenge of looking at the past and seeing if the past can be reinterpreted. And what, what, what challenges us most of all is the fact that the past having been written down makes it feel that it is a done deal. Before in tradition, as traditions were passed from, from generation to generation, each generation as it experienced life, as it experienced the conditions of the present time, each generation reinterpreted the old stories in the context of their world. As things that they held were challenged, they reinterpreted them and saw them in a different light. But the problem with writing things down is that you can always go back to the original. And even though life is moving on and evolving, because this, is, this original was held at a point in time in history, then they were probably closer to God then than we are now, especially if we, we put all of our authority in that written text and we don't allow for the divine activity in our current time. If I don't allow for the divine activity in my current time, in my life and in the life of others, then my only authority is in a written text. And no matter what I experience, I have to shove it back into that written text. And if it doesn't fit, then I have to let it go. Whereas in an oral tradition, as the storyteller tells the story, the story is embellished by the experience of the time. And we may not be aware of this, but all of these texts in our scriptures have had that done to them before they were written down. The church or the authorities or the storytellers are telling the story within the context of 
the time, within the context of the time. There's a wonderful glaring situation where um, Paul challenges this whole thing of Jews and Gentiles. And because the Gentiles were becoming Christians, the, those from Jerusalem wanted to ensure that they kept all the rules and rituals of Judaism. This, is, this would be what we now call our apostles who were themselves Jews, and wanting to maintain that Judaic experience and challenging Paul to ensure that the new Christians, these, sorry, these new believers, sorry, would do all that was required, including circumcision, etc. And Paul challenges them. And Paul says, we don't, they, don't, they don't have to, they don't need to. And we're able to see that, that particular challenge to tradition. And we hear the church in Jerusalem saying, well, okay, we, we can understand where you're coming from, and therefore we will not bind that to them. We just ask them to believe in the Lord Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. So you saw the movement there. But we don't always see that, 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 that movement in the written text. But again, because of the circumstance that persons found themselves in, that, that harsh tradition, that, that, that ancient tradition was challenged. The end result, to a large extent, was the, not that this was the only thing, but um, the whole movement of this, this group, this path, this Jesus following, coming out of Judaism and beginning to shape itself into something else. That's what this journey is all about. As God reveals time and again, we move forward. We become more. Why is it that within the context of the world we can see the wonderful developments? Albeit, yes, there are some negatives, but that's all part of it. That's all part of it. We can't, once we're in a dualistic world, we can't have one without the other. We can't have the positive without the negative. But it's, it's an unfolding. And so it is with our faith journey, our spiritual journey. It's an unfolding, it's a becoming. And we've got to be able to be open to that becoming. So this morning's text shows us that, that right in front of us. The challenge between being ready to accept and break and be open to the unfolding work of God. Don't just, don't just lock it into Jesus. It's not just about Jesus. Jesus represents, as he says, the Son of Man. The, the Son of Man, it's a title. Jesus represents the Son of Man. Jesus represents humanity. He represents the the constant unfolding and growing and becoming of the human persons and the new challenges that come to us and the new things we have to wrestle with and seek to understand. And our world, because it too is unfolding, it offers us sometimes the scientific evidence to support why this movement forward may very well be necessary. So we can't ignore all the other ways of knowing that we have available. The more we evolve, the more we have to be able to bring those ways of knowing together. Because you see, one of the things that we, we always forget is that over time, the ways of knowing began to separate themselves. So individuals began to become specialized so medicine goes off by itself, theology goes off by itself, physics goes off by itself. Everybody begins to become specialized in their area. In the early times, all of it was taken as man seeking to understand God. But obviously there was a need for that separation so it can go further. But what there's a need for too is 
as we go through that separation, as we continue in our own individual veins, there is also the need for us to talk to each other and to be able to bring together the, the knowledge that we each have gone off and found for ourselves. That in itself is a wonderful paradigm for us in this time. From our several places of separateness, to speak, to inform the whole. We will be the richer for it. We need it now more than ever. No amount of Bible bashing, no amount of shouting will cause our world to turn itself back. Our world is becoming more and more. And we either become with it or it leaves us behind. I pray that we may seize the moment and have the courage. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Says Jesus to the blind man, the man born blind and now seeing. Who is he, sir? Jesus says, the one who is speaking with you is he. The man said, the blind man from birth who now sees, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I pray, friends, that you will have a glorious weekend. And those of you who by join me tonight look forward to sharing with you as we bring our week to an end. Be inspired by God's word. Remember, be inspired. It's a launch off point. Be inspired for your own journey and your own encounter with the divine. Be blessed and be safe.